Let's open our Bibles to, uh, if you want to go one place and just park there, Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 is where we find the most beautiful picture of Jesus Christ embodying what we're talking about this morning, and that is the season of hope and that Christ is our hope. But welcome to Calvary, this season of hope. And this is a season of hope because this is when we remember how God sent hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Now remember, hope is a person. It's not a feeling. Uh, we, we sense the feeling when we have hope, but biblically defined, hope is a person and it's Jesus Christ. And hope has a name, and it's the name of Jesus. And hope through Jesus is the breath of life. I've had three funerals the last three weeks. In fact, uh, chronologically, there were three in the space of less than three weeks. And, and it is such a joy to sit with people that know Jesus Christ and that find hope that their loved one that they watch decline and get weaker and weaker and weaker is now more alive than they've ever been. It's the breath of life to, the, to those who know Christ. And that's why we so desperately need to share the truth of the season of hope. Humans are so fragile, we're threatened by any moment, the inevitability of death. We all know that we can't outrun death, we can't escape death. Uh, and I think of those, however many were at that concert at Oakland that just burned, and, and this morning the news said that, that they can't even get into that building to see how many, and they're figuring anywhere from a dozen to two dozen people died. The tragedy is not just that they died, it's that many of them died without hope. And, and hope is so vital for us to share. And as we'll see in Hebrews, uh, we're supposed to be messengers of hope. God is a God of hope, and we need to see from God's word that truth. Now, in uh, 1 Timothy, I, just, I ended with this last time, but I want to share with you the very first verse of 1 Timothy. I'll read to you. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the command of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. See, the Bible presents Jesus Christ as hope. The world thinks of hope as uh, they hope that they will get this or that, or they hope that, that uh, their health will get better or that their, their finances will turn around. But God says hope is a settled state of confidence that comes from knowing the person who gives hope. See, Jesus Christ dispenses hope. Through the God of hope, he is, through God our Savior, our hope. And we as believers are supposed to live with that hope, as we'll see in Hebrews, as an anchor to our souls. The safest spot in the universe is embracing Jesus. And the only way to have assurance of salvation and a strong confidence in a steadfast hope is by going to the source of hope. Now the picture, and, and if you're in Hebrews chapter six, we're gonna be reading from verse 17 on to the end of the chapter, but the picture in the Bible, the picture that we see is God uses an Old Testament geographic setup. In, in the Old Testament world, uh, the, the people were agrarian, the children of Israel were agricultural, they had flocks and herds and farms, and they were always involved in agriculture and you know, harvesting and chopping and, and doing different mech, you know, work with their oxen and everything. And there were always farming accidents. And, and if, while you were building your barn or while you were chopping a tree down, it fell over on someone or on the back swing of your ax, the ax head went off and you know, killed someone out that was an innocent bystander, there was a provision for people to not be tracked down by the vigilante family members, the avengers of blood. And so what God did is he made in the nation of Israel six sectors and put in the center of each geographic sector, Israel is bisected by the Jordan River and the, the Mediterranean side and then the Transjordan side. He put in the north, in the middle, and in the south six cities that if you were involved in involuntary manslaughter, you could race to that city and the relatives, the avengers of blood, couldn't get you. So that's what's behind this, this idea of Hebrews chapter six. The only way 
that people could be saved from the avengers of blood was to come to this place. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 6. So if you're there, uh, we're going to start in verse 17, and we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, and we're going to especially look at how hope is embodied in Christ and how God wants us to flee to find that hope. So chapter 6, let's stand together for the reading of God's word, and I'm going to read, and then we will... Uh, ask for the Lord to open our hearts in prayer. Verse 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Verse 20, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. What a passage, what a rich source of hope. Let's ask the Lord to open it to our hearts as we bow before him. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you that at this season, Christmas, when you, Lord Jesus, entered this world as a child, as a baby, that you entered the world as the person, the embodiment of hope. And to all who would cling in an embrace of faith to you, you offer endless unshakable hope forever, not just for this life, but forever. Thank you that that's what makes this a season of hope, and that's what we're telling people about, not just good times and festive holiday times, but the entrance of the person who is hope. And Lord, I pray this morning that if there's anyone here that's just a church attender, but they've never entered into your body, the body of Christ, the church, through being born a second time, that, that they will realize this morning that hope is a person, and that's you, Lord Jesus. And just like this beautiful picture in Hebrews 6, that they would find themselves fleeing to you as the refuge of hope. I pray that the truth of your word will transform every one of us, but especially draw some lost ones to you this day. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. As you're seated, uh, we're, we're going through the, the season of hope. We're learning how to flee to Jesus. Now, the Bible never leaves us to speculate. If God makes a promise, he tells us how we can accomplish it. And so, in this passage that we just read in Hebrews 6, it explains that Jesus is a refuge, and it explains how we flee to him for hope. I mean, it's all contained in Hebrews 6. And basically what we see is the season of hope is when Jesus came into the world, uh, that he was the embodiment of hope. Paul, the apostle, calls him our hope. And, and what he says is that, that God is our savior and God the Father who wants us to know salvation sent the Lord Jesus Christ and when we embrace him, he becomes our hope. And that was basically what Paul based his ministry on, going into the, the, the hopelessness of the Roman Empire with all their enslavements to these pagan deities and everything else, and said, here's a person that I know that you can know, and it's Jesus Christ. And he explained who he was and how they could come to him. So God wants to unleash hope into our daily lives, and he shows how in the passage we just read. And basically in this passage, the, the keys to look at is that we find hope when we have fled for refuge. So Jesus is like a refuge you can flee to, and when we come to Jesus, we're laying hold of hope. And, and hope there isn't the, the, the idea we use in America. In America, a lot of times, I hope. You know, if, if you really don't want to do something, you say, well, I hope I can. So we kind of have a distorted view of hope. In the biblical world, the word hope means a settled confidence of something you know you have, but you haven't yet received it. It's almost like you went to the store uh, and saw it purchased, you saw it go on the truck, and you know it's coming to your house, and you hope it's going to be here at any moment. It isn't a hope that you don't think it's going to happen. You just 
it isn't in front of you yet, but you know it's coming. And it's that settled confidence that it's coming. And so we lay hold on the settled confidence that we know what Christ has promised is coming. But look at what it says. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul. This hope changes the way we go through life. What, what happens is when Jesus, when we flee to Jesus and trust him by faith, he does something to us. See, a Christian is not, something, is not someone that is joined, you know, like an organization or made a decision. It's a person who God has supernaturally anchored their soul and that anchor enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner, the one that, that's holding on to the anchor, whose name is Jesus, does it. Now, this is a, a fascinating um, image that I'd like to, to take you through. God says, I want you to understand that Jesus offers hope by being a refuge. So Jesus is the refuge. And the way you get that hope is by having your soul anchored. How do we get our soul anchored to Christ? Jesus Christ calls himself this, this term where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. So Jesus is called in the Bible the forerunner. What? Now, forerunner? What's that, a Toyota? I mean, is Jesus selling cars now? You know, that we are so myopic in our, in our understanding of the Old Testament world. So to understand what this is, let me just explain to you what a forerunner was, uh, not the car. A forerunner in Bible times is a word we need to pause and consider because God chose this word right there to describe Jesus. So if God chose to describe Jesus with this word, what does it mean? Basically, the word in verse 20 in your Bible, translated forerunner, is an amazing picture of the person used in the ancient times to help a, a ship or a, a, a vessel, a naval vessel, into harbors. Now, back then, there were very few. You know, Alexandria had a harbor, and Rome had a harbor, and Athens had a harbor called Piraeus, but there were very few harbors in the ancient world. It was just coastline, rocky coastline, all the way around the Mediterranean. And so if you wanted to navigate a boat to safety, they built harbors that were very hard to get into because they were piled stones. And so what they did is they would build this harbor along the coast with a little entryway of piled stones with safe, sheltered waters, and they would put a winch on the inside of the harbor on the shore that, that had a, a wheel that could be used to winch in boats. But how would you get the boat connected to the wheel? Through the forerunner. The forerunner was a person who was on the boat, a slave often, that was told, tie the rope around your waist, jump through the waves and the storm, swim all the way to the shore, pulling that rope behind you, get in the harbor, untie the rope, hand it to the harbor master, and he will tie it to the winch and start pulling with, with all the, uh, the harbor workers, pulling that boat into through the narrow entrance of the harbor. So this was a difficult thing, but the forerunner saved the ship from being out in the storms and hitting against the rocks by bringing the rope into the harbor where it could be winched in. So what it's saying is Jesus was like that. Uh, the brave mariner offering a slave would jump from the ship, would swim through the treacherous waves and through the water, and finally wading into the harbor would fasten the strong rope of the ship to a rock along the shore and then to the winch where the vessel was brought in. So basically what they're saying is that Jesus is our forerunner. He's the one that came to us in our storm and jumped into the water and went through all of the, the perils for us, went to heaven with us tied to him, and he is now into, as it says here, into the presence within the veil. He is before God, and, and he has tied us to heaven. So the idea of the forerunner is that Jesus went before us to anchor our soul, not to earth and destruction, but to heaven. 
That's why Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. And that's why it says the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 that they look for a city in heaven. How do you change from looking for something on earth to looking for something in heaven? By having Jesus anchor your soul to heaven. And so that process he's called the forerunner. So that's the first interesting word. Uh, Jesus, our forerunner, has gone to heaven. He stands ready to guide us safely to our Father's house. We are fastened to him. He is the immovable rock. And, and no matter how many storms tear at us in our boat through life, no matter how much our vessel creaks, no matter how much the wind attempts to blow us off course and the tides try and overwhelm us, like all those boating images that the people understood, Jesus is tugging us homeward. So the storms of our health, the storms of our emotions, the storms of our relationships, the storms of our finances, the storms of all of our fears going through life are regulated and kind of put in their place by the anchor of Christ anchoring us, our souls, to heaven. And so basically this idea of Jesus anchoring our souls from Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 worked its way in. Remember, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christians cowering and, and Jewish people with them in Rome. It talks about those of Italy and, and the writer talks about his chains. They were at the height of the persecutions of Nero when this was being written. And, and so Hebrews is about how they could endure all of the Roman Empire persecutions, how they could endure all the fears they were going through of being chained and persecuted and even brought to death. And the writer of Hebrews says, the way you're gonna make it is your soul is anchored and Christ has the other end and he's never gonna let go. Uh, there are some uh, interesting, in fact, for just a moment, take out your hymn book. I wanna show you a little bit of history of doctrine. It's number 404. There's actually a hymn written about this verse that's kind of one of those golden oldies that, that people uh, uh, maybe don't even think about the references that are in it. But, but look at 404, it's by Edward Mote. Um, he was born in the 18th century and he wrote this in the, the 19th century. But, but uh, my hope is built on nothing less. And especially what I want you to see is this second stanza. And uh, uh, in fact, let's, let's uh, um, I was gonna have you sing it, but we'll sing it at the end. We'll just read it right now, okay? In your hymn book, let's read this. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale. Now look what it says. Right out of this verse, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now what is this based on? Look at verse one. My hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness that he gave himself for me. And then look at verse th or the third stanza. His oath, his covenant, his blood. What's that? That's from Hebrews 6, 17 and 18, where it says God made this oath and swore by himself. So this whole hymn is based on this Hebrews 6 passage that says we have our soul anchored and it's the other end of it is inside the veil of, of uh in the presence of God in heaven where Christ has ascended and stands and ever lives for us, and we can have our hope built on Christ. So you can put away your hymn book and go back to Hebrews because the second part of Hebrews, after he's, he's talked about the one who anchors our soul, he tells us about the benefits of what happens to those that are lassoed by him, the ones that, that are tied to Christ. He becomes our refuge. He is the one that gives us hope no matter what we face in life. Uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter 6, it, it's this big word right here. It says, we flee to Christ as our refuge. Now to us, refuge? I mean, right now, there's a political hot potato in our country, the cities of refuge in America. You know, the uh, immigrants come in and they're illegal and they can go there and be protected. That's a current version of an ancient, ancient city of refuge that, that is in the Bible. And basically what the city of refuge is, is from Joshua 20. And uh, if, if you're ever interested 
in the most beautiful picture of Jesus Christ as our refuge, it's in the cities of refuge from Joshua 20. That is the word we found in Hebrews 6. That, that word fled for refuge is exactly the, the word that's used in Joshua for these cities. Now let, let me show you. I'll give you a little Bible geography lesson. Um, here's what Joshua 20, verses 7 through 9 says. This is one of those hard places when you're reading through the Bible. This is one of the hard chapters to read because it has all these funny, large names. And for most of us, you know, it's just, they're just words. But let me show you how beautiful it is. First of all, and they assign Kedesh in Galilee by Mount Naphtali and Shechem in Mount Ephraim and Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah. And then it says, on the other side of the Jordan. So these three are on the western side of Jordan. So here are three city names that are on the western side of Jordan. And then on the other side of the Jordan, eastward of Jericho, they assign three more cities, Bezer and Ramot and Golan. Now, almost everybody's heard of the Golan Heights, and that's up in Bashan in Manasseh. So basically, what, what we have in, in Joshua 20 is a description of the refuge cities. These were refuge cities. These were designated as refuge. Now, look where they put them. Here's a, a little map. See, Israel was divided by the Jordan Rift, the Rift Valley, the Syrio-African Rift, and basically, God made it so there were six sectors of the country. And he put, geographically, uh, along the, the, the easiest to get to roads on raised hilltops, six cities that, was, that were less than one day's journey from any part of the country. You could get to, no matter which tribe you lived in, you could get to one of these within a day. And, and they were strategically located geographically. In fact, if you look at them uh, in a satellite view, I don't know how well you can see, but up here I can see the ridge road that follows the mountaintops right into Galilee. Uh, here's another river valley that goes up through the mountains. Here's another river valley. Uh, and uh, down here, this, there are passes through that you could get through. The people lived out here, but the mountain people could get there. Of course, Shechem was right in the center, and Hebron is right on the same ridge road. And so all of these cities were totally geographically and topographically on the map accessible to people in every region west and east of the Jordan Rift Syrio African Valley. And, and so these, these cities were strategically placed by the Lord for a reason. They were beacons of hope. You say, what were they for? They were for people who accidentally killed someone. And their relatives back then, people lived in clans, they lived in territories, and so they were very tight, and, and all your cousins, everybody lived around you. Your family didn't move out, you stayed close. And so if you injured someone in this clan, kind of like the, the avenger of blood would come looking for you, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, if you killed my uncle, we're gonna kill you. But if you did it involuntarily, if it was involuntary manslaughter, these cities of refuge were designed by God as a place that you could flee to for safety. So, what, what were these cities like? Well, basically, the first thing about the cities is that every one of them were designed by God in the scriptures. It says, if you read what it says in Joshua, it says, build them in visible places along roads where they're easy to reach, where no one would not know how to find it. These cities basically were on hilltops along main roads. So they were like landmarks. And, and so every one of these cities were easy to reach. And so basically, these cities of refuge, anyone could access them because they were easy to reach from any part of the country. You could walk to them, you could run to them, you could ride to them. And, and another thing that helped and aided this is that 
people were employed by, Levites were employed by the, the leadership of Israel to be at the crossroads wherever one of these cities were, where people, kind of the road split and they didn't know where to go. And there were people that said, the city of refuge, if that's what you're looking for, it looks like you're desperate, it's right up there, go that way. And there were actually people that, that guided people fleeing for their life into the safety of the city of refuge, which is fascinating how much God wanted anybody that, that needed to access it. Secondly, they weren't just kept for Jews only. This is something unusual. They were open to anyone. In fact, the scriptures said, the Israelite, the stranger, and the sojourner. If you were a Gentile traveling through the land and somehow your you know, ox cart ran over someone, you would not be killed by a mob if you could make it to one of these cities of refuge. Israelites, they knew about it. Strangers were told about it. And sojourners, people that were just, past, let's say you were from the north and you were down in the southeast quadrant and, and you know, your horse trampled someone and the mob started forming, people would say, the city of refuge is right over there. And if you can make it, it's open, open for all. And, and that was an amazing, uh, gracious work of the Lord. Something else that's interesting, these cities were instructed, once they were designated by God, the six of them, to be a city of refuge, Bezer never could close its gates and lock up for the night. Because how do you know if someone is fleeing from down here and it's getting dark and everybody's hot on their trail and can you imagine coming up and the door being locked and them, you know, skewering you right at the gates? Mm. The gates were never closed. The, the city was not locked. And when you came to it, day or night, it was never locked. It was always, always open. Anyone could access these cities of refuge because the great doors of these cities were always left open. Now, do you understand, why did God go to all this trouble? Why did he go to all this trouble of picking out six geographically spread cities, uh, putting up the word that strangers, sojourners, and Israelites are welcome, anyone could come, and making the cities never lock their gates? Why did he go to all this trouble? Because he wanted them to realize these cities were, next, a sufficient refuge. Now, what do I mean by that? Two things, uh, if you read uh, the scriptures, um, it says that if you get as close as the pasture lands. Now see these cities, here's the city, and around it was designated, the people lived in the city, but here they were allowed to have their animals out grazing. And it's kind of like when you go down 12th Street, uh, if you leave 12, the church and go down Parkview and go down 12th, you're driving along and all of a sudden there's a sign that says you're entering Portage. Now, actually, it looks the same on both sides of the sign. It looks very Kalamazooian. But once you cross the line, you're in Portage. And once you cross the line into Beezer's pasture land, it was sufficient. If you just touched anywhere inside the city of refuge, now yet eventually the people would take you inside the city because you needed to be inside and it was sufficient also if you ran for your life you couldn't take food you couldn't take your clothes you couldn't take anything and so they provided housing food and care as long as you stayed there in the city of refuge but touching any part of the border of the city you were safe it was a completely sufficient place of refuge and and the people knew that and were instructed that and another another truth is that if you killed someone accidentally in your fishing boat right there you know they didn't have a life jacket on they fell in you couldn't run over here and say I'm picking this as my city of refuge if you didn't go to one of these cities of refuge there there's no hope for you if you went there, the avengers of blood would have no guilt on them if they killed you. Even if you were innocent, if they killed you in their anger and you did not go to a designated city 
of refuge. They were not punished because they killed you because you killed their uncle and you didn't flee to the only place of hope. So it was a very interesting system. But why am I telling you all this? Because anyone could access these cities because the doors were open, they were easy to get to, you just touch the property, they were within reach of everybody, but it was the only place of hope. Now, Christ our hope, Hebrews 6, says that Jesus is our refuge. And the word from chapter 20 of Joshua describes Jesus as being just like these cities. Now, now how would we say that? And why? Because Jesus is easy to reach. If you think about it in the Bible, Jesus is said in Acts chapter 17 to be closer than an arm's length away from everybody. That's what Paul said when he was speaking in Athens. He says, you should try and find the Lord because he's closer, he's within reach. He's within one arm's length of everyone. How can that be? Because he's omnipresent. So Jesus can be cried out to, reached out for, prayed to, and longed for by anyone anywhere on the planet. Anybody. At any time, he is easy to reach. In fact, Jesus is the easiest person to reach of all. I mean, even with texting and phone calling, I mean, I can lose Bonnie in Walmart, you know? I mean, and, and I look for her all the time, and, and I'm strolling along saying, I'm about aisle 13, where are you? She says, well, I'm on 14, you know, and you, you, you finally find each other. Did you know Jesus is a prayer, a thought, just an outreached hand from anyone? It's just amazing to think of how Jesus is such a picture of our hope. Uh, the, the echoes of Christ opens arms are all the way through the scriptures. When the Lord called to Adam in the Garden of Eden after he sinned, what did God say in Genesis 3.9? He said, Adam, where are you? Who was looking for whom? God came looking for the sinner. And God came within reach of Adam and Eve, and God, through Christ, comes within reach of every person in the world. That's why when I grew up, my parents were heavy into the Lansing City Rescue Mission, and they asked me to speak. That's where I, I used to practice when I was 12 and 13. They would take me to speak at the mission, and sometimes every week I would speak there, and what I would always say is to those men assembled, hopeless most of them, alcoholics many of them, uh, totally destitute, that Jesus was in easy reach. Jesus also is open to all. Uh, just like the cities of refuge were for the stranger, the sojourner, Jesus says, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. With me, it doesn't matter whether you're barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. He says, I am here for everyone whoever will call on me. And he said, I'm completely sufficient. Do you remember once Jesus was standing with his long robe with tassels on it, and the crowd was around him, and this woman gets on her hands and knees and goes down along the ground and reaches between everybody's ankles and finds the tassel of Jesus' robe and grabbed it. Any part of Jesus was completely sufficient. That's Mark chapter 5. And that woman was instantly healed because she touched, reached out, sought. And she couldn't get his eyes, she couldn't get his voice, she couldn't see his hands, but at least she got his, the fringe. Jesus is completely sufficient. If you get anywhere, any part of him, he says it's enough, it's sufficient for everything that you need. And finally, Jesus never locks his gates, he never says it's too late, I'm, I'm too busy now. And Jesus also is the only refuge. In fact, that's what we're going to cover tonight uh, in our little church history installment after the concert. How can Jesus be the only way? And there be so many denominations and religions and everything else. And that's what we'll talk about. But he is the only refuge. So, Jesus is our hope. Why? Because he's easy to reach. When I lead someone to Christ, I was just in my office, had someone stop in, they came in for something else, and I said, well, before we cover that, why don't we cover something else, and then we'll talk about yours, and they were kind of captives, and so I went through, and I said, 
you're interested in getting married. I said, but that's only the second greatest day of your life. The first and greatest day is the day you meet Jesus Christ. And I went through the gospel with them. And I said, Jesus is right here in this office. He's easy to reach. That's your biggest need. His arms are open wide right now. Anywhere we go in the world, we can point people to Jesus. His arms are open wide. He's saying, come unto me. He says, I'll never lock the door. While you have life and breath, don't harden your heart. You can come. He's the completely sufficient one, and he's the only hope. That's the God that we worship this morning, and that's the Savior whose arms are open wide. Let's bow and prepare for communion as the elders and deacons go to prepare to serve us. And let's bow before our mighty God. Father in heaven, I thank you that Jesus is the refuge of hope. His arms are open today. He's within arm's reach of anyone. He is completely sufficient. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will find hope and peace and forgiveness and cleansing. And you will tie that that rope around us and anchor us in our final destination, in your presence, in our Father's house. And we can go through life feeling pulled a notch closer to you every single day, knowing this world is not our home, but our citizenship is in heaven. I pray for anyone that is here and has never partaken of Christ, right here, under the sound of your word, they can bow before you and cry out, you've said whoever will call on the name of the Lord that you will save and you will transform and you are sufficient to cleanse and forgive and anchor any soul that cries to you within the veil in heaven. Bless us as we celebrate our hope in Christ through communion and help us to become beacons of hope, pointing people to Jesus Christ, you, our city of refuge. Thank you for this bread. A reminder that you gave your body to take away our sins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.